Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, Knoxville History Project's uh, fourth annual luncheon. Um, we sincerely uh, appreciate you taking uh, the, joining this uh, adventure with us today. Uh, I know we're all a little zoomed out in, at times, and uh, but maybe it, uh, it beats uh, going down the foundry today and finding a parking spot or braving the heat, which uh, certainly uh, today is not too bad, is it? Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to get started and kind of MC this event. Um, I want to, on behalf of the Knoxville History Project, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank all of our table hosts for all the hard work uh, attracting uh, guests today and also those who can't join us but are going to send in donations. Thanks to everybody. I uh, also want to highlight um, Noble Robinette and Pete Carty are our hardworking volunteers. Uh, they're the documentarians working on our Tennessee Valley Fair uh, documentary that we're going to preview today for you. And also Doug Mills and our KHP board member, Linda Billman, uh, for working uh, very hard the last couple of weeks, uh, pulling together, uh, pulling the stops for a, for a short uh, honorarium video with Jack Neely and uh, Dr. Jim Tumblin that we'll be uh, showing uh, in a few minutes uh, to honor Dr. Tumbling for his uh, significant contributions to Knoxville history. Uh, our fundraising goal today is $15,000, and we're thrilled to, uh, to announce that we're already up to, I think, about over 6,000. So thanks to everybody who's uh, here today or has donated already today as part of this campaign. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there's going to be three parts of this presentation. First, I, I'm going to uh, talk about a few minutes just to kind of summarize the work of the Knoxville History Project. Uh, then we're going to watch a short preview, again, of our Tennessee Valley Fair, the 100th years uh, that we filmed last year of that. And then I'm going to hand it over to Jack Neely, who is going to make some key re remarks and then introduce uh, Dr. Jim Tumblin and uh, show an honorarium uh, memorial video, honorarium video um, on, on Dr. Tumblin. And then finally, uh, Casey Fox, our chair of our board, is going to get up and uh, speak about, uh, inspire you to think about making a donation uh, in support of our great work at the History Project. So um, what is the Knoxville History Project all about? Well, on this slide, you can see that our mission is to research and promote the history and culture of Knoxville. Uh, we're dedicated to that, and as simple as it sounds, um, it takes a lot of effort to conduct uh, thorough research and uh, employ um, talented writers. Obviously, our key one, a senior historian, is, is Jack Neely and his decades of experience. Um, but also, we're, we're reaching out to more writers and more presenters uh, to be involved with our work. And it takes a lot of time and money to, uh, to produce quality programs. Uh, and also, we, we spend a lot of time combing through local collections, whether it's at the McClung Collection or the University of Tennessee Library, their impressive uh, digital collections. Um, and we're also in the, in the process of developing a, a new a digital archive, uh, courtesy of the wonderful images that uh, Knoxvillians are sharing with us uh, through our Knoxville Shoebox, Shoebox program. Um, Alex, the next slide. Alex, next slide. One of the key things that we're absolutely known for, uh, Jack Neely particularly, is, is busy every week. Um, doing talks and presentations. Um, we are started a uh, Zoom uh, series every Thursday. Alex, can you go back on the, on the, on the slide to, uh, to the second slide there? We've, we've advanced uh, several slides. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, obviously, we, because of the pandemic, we've had to uh, pause our programs, but we are doing a weekly Zoom on Thursday at six o'clock. Uh, next week, uh, Jack and I will be tag teaming it and uh, talking about Knoxville artists from the past, uh, particularly through the lens of our downtown uh, art wraps program. Um, and also, uh, <clears throat> one of the, the last slide, we also had a picture of Bob Booker, who's one of our favorite guest speakers, and we honored uh, him two years ago at our annual event. And hopefully soon, um, we'll have uh, Renee Kessler from the Beck Cultural Center and um, She'll be joining us soon as well on, on our series. Um, next slide. Here's Jack at uh, Old Ray Cemetery. Um, he works with Dr. Patricia Rutenberg from UT. Uh, I think she's here today. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Rutenberg. Uh, leading cultural uh, tours uh, around town using the city of Knoxville as an outdoor laboratory. Um, 
and also leading tours with students to maybe Hazen House and Westwood and all kinds of areas, uh, historical sites around town. Uh, here we have Jack Neely uh, leading a, a tour at Rhythm and Blooms from a couple of years ago. It's one of our very popular uh, ongoing tours of downtown and elsewhere. And on the right, shout out for the wonderful historian Laura Still, who leads Knoxville Walking Tours. And uh, she supports our work and uh, it's a great partnership. I'd love to um, put a, a great shout out for Laura. If you've not done one of her tours with KnoxvilleWalkingTours.com, I highly recommend that you join Laura on our ongoing series. Okay, next. Next slide, Alex, please. Thank you. Um, if you're not familiar with it, we also have an ongoing series of uh, oral history conversations. Um, with, uh, we've, we've recently, the last couple of years, we've uh, interviewed Carol Mayo Jenkins, uh, artist in residence at UT, and uh, the early, early years in Knoxville involved with the beginnings of the Carousel Theatre. Uh, on the right, you have Conrad Majors. Uh, when he was a young lad, uh, working with his grandparents at Greenlee's Bicycle Shop on Walnut Avenue, he had he was at the run of the town when he was about six, seven years old. Incredible stories that he shared with us, and these are all on our website. And the two young girls, the two young sisters uh, in the middle, are Sherry uh, Wallace and her sister uh, Sharon, who uh, shared their stories of growing up in uh, Island Home. And uh, we also have David Mize as well, talking about the history of uh, Beard and when he was growing up. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of our signature programs, of course, is our publications. Um, we do an annual story publication every year. We work with UT and the Veterans Administration on a history, uh, first time it's ever been done on the National Cemetery. Um, and also, uh, next slide, we work with um, Knox County Public Library to make all of our story collections and compilations and all our books uh, available through special hardback covers. Uh, so thanks for the friends of the Knox County Public Library to enable us to do that. Um, next slide. Um, our latest project that we work with the, with the city, following up our history of uh, history of public works, uh, we did a about 100-page booklet of the mayors of Knoxville. Jack wrote biographies of all the mayors, going back to um, Thomas Emerson in uh, 1816, all the way through um, Mayor Madeline Rohero last year. That book, by the way, is not available through us, but it is available through uh, just the, uh, exclusively through one of our partners, and that is Visit Knoxville, representing the city there. So look at great stories, complementing the restoration of the mayoral portraits uh, on the fifth floor of the city and county building. Uh, next slide. Of course, I have to mention our, uh, our most popular book. We've sold about 2,700 copies of Historic Knoxville, The Curious Visitor's Guide, contains uh, in full color, 200 pages, uh, all the historic homes of Knoxville, museums and collections here locally that have a, obviously a historic uh, bent. Um, it's essentially a walking tour of, of downtown Knoxville, all, all our wonderful uh, historic buildings and, uh, and sites that are, that are extant. Uh, also neighborhoods and parks and cemeteries and cemeter uh, and also key Civil War sites. So uh, it's the, we're actually uh, waiting on our next shipment for the second printing of that edition. Uh, next slide. But we're really excited this summer at uh, another little victim, short and temporary victim of the uh, of the pandemic is our historic Bearden uh, title. Um, here's some pages, by the way, of uh, is our historic, historic Knoxville book. Alex, next uh, slide, please. But historic Bearden is 200 year story of uh, Knoxville's fourth uh, Creek Valley uh, will hopefully be out in late July or next uh, in August. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's a history of the of Erin the early settlement that became before Bin, uh, the brickyard in the African community that, that grew up and adjacent to that commercial center, as well as all the inns and motels and businesses along uh, Kingston Pike. Of course, Lions View, the long, uh, deep history of black owners um, along Lions View before the Cherokee Country Club got established in, in 1907. But also Lakeshore Park, of course, and the, and the early history of the mental institution there, uh, as well as the tourist era. And uh, not who could forget, obviously, the uh, the history of the city, the Knoxville's uh, first aviation uh, fields and uh, the city city airport, uh, McGee Tyson, Tyson McGee, Mike McGee Tyson. Next slide, please. Um, also, want to highlight uh, our downtown art wraps. Uh, we have done twenty uh, art wraps at downtown. Here we're looking at uh, Russell Briscoe's uh, wonderful painting of the Storm Theatre, uh, right in front of where it's stood, opposite the Bijou Theatre. Um, from the East Tennessee Historical Society collection. Uh, thank them for sharing it. 
Uh, and also on the right uh, on Main Street, uh, Caddy Corner from the Medical Arts uh, Building, uh, a painting by Earl Henry, this red-shouldered hawk. And uh, Dr. Earl Henry was uh, an ornithologist and a dental um, professional that uh, worked in the uh, Plaza Building. Uh, next slide, please. We also have separate, several Catherine Wiley uh, paintings. Here's one we installed on West Jackson Avenue in front of Bolter Beer Works. And our last uh, last art wrap that we've done is a Carl Sublet from the Ewing, UT Ewing Gallery collection, which is uh, at the foot of the hill there as you're going up towards the campus uh, on 11th Street at Cumberland. Uh, we have several uh, new ones in the works. We have two uh, going in uh, around the Civic Coliseum, um, highlighting Ruth Cobb Bryce, an African-American painter we're working with Beck Cultural Center on, and also a series uh, along Magnolia Avenue, which is still in the works with the city as part of the streetscapes there. Uh, we're going to be incorporating a Joseph Delaney, another Buford Delaney, uh, and another Ruth Cobb Bryce as well. Uh, next slide. If you're looking for uh, more stories online, uh, our history portal um, contains image galleries and audio in, uh, interviews. Uh, there is history from all sectors of downtown, of, of, of Knoxville and downtown and Market Square. Uh, next slide, please. We've just expanded our, our Black History uh, section of, the, of our website, as well as uh, launched a new one on uh, explorers and uh, Smoky Mountain, Smoky Mountain explorers and naturalists. That's one of the things that I talked about uh, last week as part of our Zoom, uh, talking about uh, the history of Knoxville explorers uh, of the Smoky Mountains. Next slide, please. Uh, almost close here. I uh, just wanted to put a, a big shout out for our uh, Knoxville Shoebox, our ongoing um, initiative engaging the community to share images from their own collections. Next slide, please. And following a, a, a little uh, news item that we had from uh, from Channel 10. Next slide, please. Uh, well, definitely want to say a thank you to Cindy and Mark Proto. Um, they have shared uh, hundreds of uh, photographs and uh, postcards uh, from their collection. If we can just go back, to Alex, please, to that last one. Um, should be able to see uh, some important postcards that we've used in some of our books. The top, top left there is, there is the women's building that used to sit on Main Street, uh, Calico Cafe, which was on Walnut. Um, down the bottom is, is the bottom uh, in East Knoxville that was a very poor, predominantly African-American community that used to flood uh, very often. And up there on the right is, is a wonderful postcard of uh, late uh, 1890s of the Stop Theater that we just looked at. So if you have any, any uh, gems, postcards, photographs that you'd like to share with us digitally, we definitely love speaking to you. Um, next slide, please. Also, I just want to mention uh, that we're also in the, in the pro in, uh, planning to do some digital walking tours in the future, as well as uh, some new podcast series with, with Pete Carty, uh, and hopefully some new documentaries as well. So um, I want to end here on uh, previewing with you uh, our 100th Tennessee Valley Fair documentary. Uh, in the shot here, uh, second from uh, from the left is uh, Pete no uh, is, uh, Noble Robinette, who's a wonderful uh, videographer. And on the far right is Pete Cardi, who's a, an audio engineer. And they put in well over 60 hours of filming last September at the Tennessee Valley Fair in, in a really uh, hot temperatures. And uh, we are going to, I'm going to ask Alec now to tee up this video and uh, we're going to sit back and watch just about 10 minutes of our preview of the Tennessee Valley Fair documentary. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Knoxville's Chilhowee Park and opening day of the 100th edition of the Tennessee Valley Fair. Today marks a very special time in the life of the fair as we begin the 10-day celebration of our centennial birthday. Since 1916, the Tennessee Valley Fair has been and continues to be one of the longest running and most popular family events in our city and the East Tennessee area. Tennessee Valley Fair, I think, is something I, I'm afraid people take it for granted and they don't realize that this is a classic American institution, the annual fair, which has been going on in one way or another, you know, since the mid-19th century. Because it was, it was there all through all the ups and downs of the 20th century. I mean, when Knoxville was called the ugliest city in America, you know, the Tennessee Valley Fair was right there. It was, it was kind of kept going. Where the Vols were winning or losing, or whether people thought Knoxville was a hellhole or a, a great place for a vacation, the Tennessee Valley Fair was there every year. You know, it's continuity. It's kept something that's kept things going through. You know, we've always had that to count on. Thank you. 
So the 100th this year is going to be bigger and better than ever. Um, we have a lot of things coming back. So we're bringing back the money pole that some people may remember and the paddle boats across the lake. Probably most importantly, we have a great exhibit that's going to take place. It's going to recap our 100 year history. Pictures, memorabilia will be shown as well as some video loops. Um, we're talking with people around the community who have been involved with the fair for a very long time to really get those stories. This is a, a community event, so we want our community's voices to be heard and reflect back on those 100 years. This is my granddaughter, Lila Bell, and she's the reason I'm in Tennessee. But she has been making crafts since she was a little bitty girl. And she started off entering things here, her drawings. Uh, she loves to paint, she loves to bake, she loves to make Lego things. The fair is all about children. It's about building their self-esteem. The sky is the limit to the things they can do here. A hundred years of memories, making memories with your family at a county fair is something that they'll take with them the rest of their lives. And we'll all sit around the bedside in the nursing home and talk about the fun that, that we've had. If somebody has never been to the fair, and, and I want to describe it, I would probably say it's a tremendous event that has something for everybody. The fair is the only um, venue that you can go to where you can come out and you can watch, you know, livestock competitions, you know, be it sheep, or goats, or, or cattle, something to see the tractor pull, demolition derbies, rodeo, headlining concert entertainment, and just to come out and watch people. I mean, that's probably one of the my favorite thing to do is just having a great time. Well, uh, I guess uh, I'm having a little bias. I would describe it as uh, probably the, one of the best fairs in the southeast of the United States. And, uh, you know, we have the motorcycle guy coming across the uh, cable on, across the lake, and um, I, I'm anxious to see that that gets done. Yeah, it sounds just like it says. A guy is going to ride a motorcycle on a Height rope across Lake Odyssey. It's gonna scare me. I don't like heights, so I'm gonna be like, ah, the whole time. So I talked to the guy and I said, Mike, how do, you, how do you do that? And he said, ain't easy. And I said, well, I agree with that. So we've been trying to find volunteers to replace him if he falls off, so. Well, now, what are some of the new features in this year's fair? Well, of course, uh, Jay, we'll have a number of new features in our exhibits. One of the outstanding new features we'll have will be the wildlife exhibit that will be staged by the Tennessee Game and Fish Commission. This will be in a large tent on the lower parking lot, and it'll include all kinds of snakes and fish and wildlife that is native to East Tennessee. Another exhibit and feature that we believe uh, the youngsters and probably the oldsters too will enjoy will be the barnyard nursery. This is an exhibit of all the baby young of various barnyard animals and fowl. For instance, baby chicks and baby turkeys and baby calves and baby pigs and that sort of thing. Uh, we've seen it in other places and it's been a real attraction. Of course, one of the highlights of our free attractions outside of our free open ash shore is the diving mules be diving off of a 30-foot tower into five feet of water, and I'm, I'm quite anxious to see that myself. So am I. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonard Rogers. You know, when I was a kid, I, I have to say I, I missed a lot of the cool stuff, that I, what I think is cool stuff now, like the, uh, like the uh, some of the livestock shows I think are fascinating now in a way that I didn't as a kid. And I don't remember ever paying much attention to the historic buildings, so like, the, like the bandstand. But what, in my, when I was a kid, I was always pulling on my mom or dad to, to go over to the Midway, which was on the other side of Magnolia. It was a different place. And we went through a, uh, through a tunnel underneath Magnolia, and, and it was kind of like a portal into another dimension that you'd walk across, walk through this tunnel. On the other side, it was all bright and noisy and, and lots and lots of stuff going on. That's where all the rides and all the sideshows and all the hookster contest things and all this stuff was all happening over there. It was just a really exciting place to be, like something supernatural almost. When I was a kid coming to the fair, the only place I went was the poultry barn. I've been coming to, to the Tennessee Valley Fair since I was six years old. And I still have my first time to get on a ride, ever. Yeah, I have never rode on a ride at, this, or at any fair. Or I've raised birds since 1962. My favorite thing about it is my love for the birds. 
and getting to help the people that come in that are just learning and showing them where they go and telling them a little history about their bird and that kind of stuff. You know, I really enjoy it. The birds was the only thing I wanted to do. Uh, it's the love of my life. Well, this is uh, what remains of the old Lake Odyssey, uh, which was uh, established by uh, Fernando Beeman, uh, who is a dairyman uh, from up north and moved here after the Civil War and established his dairy here and had a nice, uh, dammed up a, a brook and made a, a nice, a pretty good sized lake here. It's changed in size and shape some over the years, but it's, it's still here today and uh, is kind of a central aspect to the uh, to Chihuahua Park. Nussel was growing really rapidly at the time, lots and lots of industries. We had about 60 or 70 factories downtown, uh, thousands of people moving in for jobs and so forth, but we hadn't ever made an allowance for a city park. Uh, it was, they were using every acre of the downtown area and there were no parks at all. So there was a demand and interest in having a, a park, kind of a refuge away from this kind of crowded, smoky, noisy city. And, and I think he knew that, and he founded this place and called it Lake Odyssey, and I think almost immediately it was a popular destination for people. It has been a, a site of uh, everything from boat rides over the years, uh, uh, swimming, and, and my favorite thing was water baseball. There was a sport that was played here some in the uh, very early uh, 20th century, late 19th century, where they would have, uh, have floating bases, and batters would, would bat a, 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 a floating ball and uh, and swim from one base to another. Um, I wish they still did that. I'm not sure why they don't. Of course, within a short time, in 1890, a, a fellow named William Gibbs McAdoo, a very young guy who would later do a, astonishing things with his life, he later became, would become a U.S. Secretary of the Treasury and under Wilson. But in, in the 1890s, he was a, a young lawyer who had an idea for a, an electric streetcar that went from downtown to Lake Odyssey, they called it. But this was something he built in, in 1890, and it was uh, immediately popular. The electric streetcars, by the way, were very new in America. A lot, most, a lot of cities didn't have them yet. Even New Orleans didn't have it yet. But we had an electric streetcar in 1890, thanks to William Gibbs McAdoo building this line to Chihuahua Park from downtown. Uh, it, it became a, immediately a Knoxville institution. One of the surprises in research uh, that I that really surprised me was the extent to which the Tennessee Valley Fair as we know it, as it was founded in 1916, was a reflection of the expositions. It was a, a lot of the people who founded the fair in 1916 had been leaders of the exposition era, which I'd always taken to be a completely different kind of a thing. But I read over and over as I get into it in 1916 that these people wanted to get some of this excitement of the exposition era to keep going in Knoxville every year. They couldn't do a, a giant national conservation exposition every year, but they could do something like that on the same site and in some kind of version of this that was more like a classic American fair, which is what the Tennessee Valley Fair became. Well, everyone, I hope uh, you enjoyed that little preview of our Tennessee Valley Fair documentary. Uh, again, everything that you watched there was either recorded fresh uh, from by Noble and Pete, uh, or, or it shows vintage footage from, from uh, the Tamis Collection, uh, Channel 10, and also Bradley Reeves. So uh, really proud of that developing um, documentary. And also, uh, just, just to let you know, even though it's not quite finished yet, the interviews, in addition to Jack, were with largely the staff at the Tennessee Valley Fair, and we're very sad for them that the Tennessee Valley Fair is not going to happen this year. But uh, we will be premiering it, and I hope you can join us at some kind of event uh, later in the year. Uh, it's my uh, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Jack. Uh, the next part of it, um, Jack is our founding executive director at the Knoxville History Project. As many of you know, he is a long-standing journalist and an author that has written more books uh, and Knoxville history than anyone uh, in the history of this town. And he's also our chief researcher and writer and speaker. So uh, take it away, Jack. Thank you. Right, thanks a lot, Paul. And thanks everybody for joining us in this uh, in this kind of unexpected experiment uh, with uh, with uh, with virtual uh, uh, gatherings. 
I'm, I'm very, uh, I regret that we can't deliver a hot chicken dinner this year, uh, as we always have, but uh, I hope next year we'll give you an extra dessert or something to make up for it next year. Um, uh, in this strange season of the coronavirus, we are apt to judge our value by whether we provide essential services or not. That's a phrase we've been hearing a lot lately. Um, it's been, in short, a very uh, tough time for cultural nonprofits who don't deliver groceries or health care. Uh, what role can a tiny historical organization like the Nostal History Project serve in an era of deadly global pandemic and strong racial and cultural divisions? Uh, perhaps a very important role, I think. Um, history is key to a city's identity, uh, of course. It creates context, it inspires interest, and it makes any city uh, that has a history stand out among other cities. Uh, more importantly, uh, history can give people a reason to care about their community. That's basic, I think, and I've talked about that before, but history also helps us understand the news uh, and respond to it appropriately and effectively. A, uh, a deadly global pandemic might seem cause for despair if we believed that we had never been here before. In the last three months, uh, television stations, radio stations, and newspapers have sought our help in making sense of a coronavirus by putting it in context with Nostal's experiences with much deadlier uh, infectious diseases in the past. At KHP, we have a little uh, experience with the subject. Back in 2018, at the East Tennessee History Center, we gave a well-attended presentation on the subject of global pandemics uh, and how they affected Knoxville. I'm not gonna claim that we predicted uh, uh, COVID-19, but in uh, discussing the 1918 flu, uh, which uh, killed about 200 Knoxvillians in the space of one month, we did emphasize the fact that this could happen again. If you haven't seen our article about that 1918 flu, by the way, and, and how it affected Knoxville, uh, it's easy to find on our website. Um, the nation's other current crisis also connects to Knoxville, even in uh, news commentary about confrontations in the streets and speeches by demonstrators, history is repeatedly invoked um, about uh, slavery, about lynch mobs, about statues of some people whose names have not been in the news in more than a century. Although much of the new interest seems negative, it's proof that people are interested in history and consider it relevant and even urgently vital. Uh, they're not simply ignoring history as previous generations have. Although Knoxville has uh, less of a, of a history of racial violence than many other cities do, we do have one harrowing example of what happens when racist assumptions get out of hand, and it makes that prospect impossible to ignore. Last summer, we commemorated the centennial of Knoxville's racially motivated riots of 1919. Um, with a special public presentation by our founding board member, Robert Booker, who was already uh, one of our previous annual uh, honorees. That riot, whose human cost remains unclear, is important to remember that even in a place as peaceful as Knoxville, simmering suspicions and resentments can make things go very badly wrong. And there are also many uh, more positive stories about race, of course, and we tell these too. A lot of Knoxvillians may not think of West Knoxville as a place with, a, with an African-American heritage, but our upcoming book about Bearden has some surprises in that regard. Um, our uh, research turned up a great deal of previously little known detail about the Brickyard, Old Lions View, and Bearden's other African-American communities. They were once better known. It includes uh, the story of a formidable young woman uh, named Fanny Lane, who in 1926, uh, almost 30 years before Rosa Parks, refused to give up her front seat on the Lions View streetcar. She was arrested too, but didn't have an organization behind her, uh, so we forgot about her. Uh, but we think it's impossible to tell these stories. Knoxvillians have often tried to think regionally, uh, sometimes to the extreme. People like to talk about Knoxville and East Tennessee as if they're the same thing. Uh, when I was writing for a daily newspaper here, I found uh, that uh, when I wrote uh, the word Knoxville, an editor would some often change it to East Tennessee. Um, when I asked why, they said uh, that they were a regional paper and wanted to expand their readership regionally and didn't want to hurt the feelings of people who didn't live in Knoxville. But Knoxville is not the same thing as East Tennessee, and one of the most dramatic ways that is different is in its racial makeup. In most of our neighboring uh, East Tennessee counties, the African-American population is very low, in some cases less than 1%. In the city of Knoxville, though, the black population is 17%. That's higher than the state of Tennessee, 
higher than the United States as a whole. Since the 1790s, Black people have been a major part of Knoxville's history and culture, and they're part of nearly every subject pertaining to Knoxville, whether it's art, as interpreted in, uh, in our art wraps, our music, our, our literature, our cuisine, our sports, even our politics. As we pointed out in our recent book, uh, Knoxville Lives, in 1869, a bold and outspoken politician named Isaac Gammon was elected to Knoxville City Council and joined by a colleague named David Brown became the first black members of one of the first mixed race city governments in the history of the entire world. Most cities can't tell that story, we should. Since we're the only educational nonprofit that focuses on the city itself, it's, it's more incumbent on us at the Knoxville History Project to, to relate and connect black history in ways that help us all to appreciate it. And maybe if we're lucky, use that history to unite the city. For around a million East Tennesseans, in fact, Knoxville's Knoxville story may be their region's closest access to the story of race in America. It's all relevant. We're lucky uh, that it's also so rich and so fascinating. Of course, there are countless other ways that history should play an active role and positive role in our society. As I've reminded my friends in the news media, history is part of every news story. You can't report on any news story fully and fairly without including its background. Uh, history, whether you call it that or not, is what holds a community together. That works best when people understand it. History is what distinguishes Knoxville among American cities. You can't understand Knoxville without its history. Of course, we were uh, expecting our big emphasis this summer and fall to be on women and their right to vote. It's the centennial of the passage of the 19th Amendment. It's hard to believe that uh, some of our most influential 20th century cultural leaders like impressionist artist Catherine Wiley or Bertha Walburn Clark, the founder of the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra, um, uh, or Annie Davis, uh, who uh, led the founding of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, uh, were even as adults forbidden to vote. Um, in 1923, Lizzie Crozier French ran for city council, vying to be its first female member. She lost, but not by much. Today, in 2020, we have a majority female city council for the first time in history. And this year, one century after the 19th Amendment, America has more women running for Congress, uh, and for what it's worth, most of them are Republicans, uh, than ever before in history. East Tennessee, and to some extent, Knoxvillians played an extraordinary role in that national story. Last year, uh, New York Times columnist Gail Collins uh, remarked that in this era, of anxiety over statues in public places, Knoxville is a rare city that has two statues devoted to something peaceful and progressive, uh, that is women's suffrage. We've been working on our, working with our colleague, uh, Laura Still on a historical walking tour to tell that story in a provocative way and hope to have that done soon. Uh, we've been uh, uh, especially known for the, the dozens of uh, public events we host every year at, at KHB. We, we host, uh, talks and tours and slideshows and public discussions all over town, uh, sometimes in other counties and occasionally in other states. Um, we've generally uh, judged our success by how much we can pack a room full of people. Uh, but when the pandemic hit, it yanked our business model out from under us and we shifted our emphasis from in-person gatherings to a series of driving tours of Knoxville. Some spoken word podcasts and, and, casts and tour, tours will follow soon. Our constituents, Constituency has shifted their habits too and, and followed us, I'm glad to say. I'm, I, I learned that uh, just yesterday that during the first three months of the COVID shutdown, traffic on our website, knoxvillehistoryproject.org, has more than doubled with almost 12,000 users, uh, individual users since March, and almost 25,000 page views. It, it was gratifying to see that we are still reach, reaching people in spite of everything. And I, I uh, appreciate the help of uh, our, our uh, assistant, Nicole Stahl, for keeping, uh, keeping up, up with, that, uh, with, with our website. On our website, we have uh, well over 100 stories, all free to read without uh, subscriptions or pop-up ads, and hundreds of historical photographs. Uh, creating a top-notch uh, website with hundreds of images and articles was a good public investment. Uh, even though it doesn't bring us much in terms of revenue. It's just part of our mission. And maybe uh, we also are doing the Zoom presentations, as Paul mentioned. Uh, it may be surprising uh, that the only guidebook to the city of Knoxville published in the last 30 years was created not by a national publisher or not, not by the city itself, but by our little nonprofit. 
we grat we are gratified that our 200 page book historic knoxville the curious visitor's guide has been popular with both locals and visitors and that it has won a, an award of distinction last year from our friends at the east tennessee historical society uh, we may be the only organization whose main purpose is to study the city of knoxville and to make uh, what we learn available to the public but some folks are surprised that we get no regular funding from city county state or federal government Although we charge fees for our tours and specific research jobs, our main source of income is still donations from those who see value in what we do. Right now, we're a very rare donor-based educational nonprofit that's focused on the city of Knoxville. We could do very little of what we do without your help, and I, we very much appreciate it, and thanks for coming today. Uh, now I'll yield the, the floor, in a, in a sense, uh, or the virtual floor, to one of the our most stalwart supporters and friends. He's, uh, he's uh, a nationally known man of medicine, a former president of the American Optometric, Op Optometric Association, who has become especially well-known in the last 20 years or so in his second career as the historian laureate of Fountain City. He has brought up uh, the complexity of the area where he has spent most of his life uh, researching and writing about uh, its industrialists, its conservationists, its inventors, its writers, its musicians. Um, and uh, I have to say, no one misses the McClung collection uh, more than Dr. Tublin and I do. We hope it will be open uh, again soon. Anyway, he's with us here to, today uh, watching our proceedings quietly, uh, but a, a, a couple of weeks ago, he uh, we had a uh, socially distanced conversation with him uh, at one of his favorite places, Adair Park in Fountain City. And I'd like to, to show that to you right now. Do we have that ready to go? Here we are at uh, Adair Park in Fountain City. And uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here with uh, the 2020 honoree of the Knoxville History Project's uh, Historian of the Year Award, uh, Dr. Jim Tumblin. Uh, Dr. Tumblin, I uh, really appreciate your, your joining us today. Your, uh, your work on, uh, on Fountain City history, which is so often really Knoxville history, has been invaluable. First, I want to thank you very much for the honor. I appreciate the fact that you and uh, your board have honored me. I feel humbled by it, and as the saying goes, I don't deserve it, but <laughs> I will accept it. <laughs> right. Dr. Tumblin, tell us something about your background in, in Fountain City. I came to Fountain City when I was in the sixth grade and uh, lived in Dare Gardens until I went into the service in 1944. So uh, I almost feel like I've spent my lifetime in Fountain City, but I was born in Park City. We were in First Christian Church and Hop Bailey, the superintendent of schools, was a good friend of my dad and a fellow church member and Sunday school member. My dad said, Mr. Bailey, where would you want to raise your boys if you're going to raise them again? They were five or ten years older than um, we three boys. And Hop said, oh, Fountain City. And our dad said, why? And he said, well, Central High School. At the time, I think Central High School might have been the equivalent of uh, Webb School. Tell me about some of the teachers at Central High. Probably my favorite two were H.T. Seymour, who later was a squire for Knox County, equivalent of a county commissioner, a wonderful math teacher. And he taught me to like math better than I did previously. <laughs> but I guess my favorite teacher of all time was Nanny Lee Hicks, the senior history teacher. Miss Hicks was a very unusual uh, personality. and. Uh, Probably I liked her because she kind of lived an antique life. She was a member of all the historical societies, but she was raised uh, just outside Madisonville in Monroe County, a highly democratic county, if you may know about it. So she still believed that the South won the war, <laughs> couldn't be convinced <laughs> otherwise. And she believed that uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was the only president we ever had that was <laughs> worth his salt. So uh, she sort of influenced me in both directions. Yeah. Over the years, I've been a student of both uh, the Civil War and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Did you live in Fountain City by the, uh, by the early 60s when it was annexed? 
I was here in 1962 when it was annexed. Yeah. What were your feelings about that? I was markedly opposed to it, like uh, about 80 percent. One of our biggest grocery stores was owned by John Brothers, and he did a poll, mail postcard poll, of Fountain City uh, subscribers to the water company that had, had our own water company. Mm -hmm. And 80 percent of them said, no, we don't need to be annexed. After a couple of years of negotiation, the city made one great big promise that changed a lot of people's minds. And they said, you may have free taxes for a year. One of the pictures I ran across yesterday was a, a picture of the parade that started at uh, Fountain City Park and went all the way down Broadway to Greenway. Mm -hmm where they had a ceremony and Fountain City surrendered to the city of Knoxville. <laughs> How did you, you as, a, as an optometrist, get interested in telling, uh, telling the stories of Fountain City? My dear mother, uh, Gladys Connor Tumblin, C-O-N-N-E-R, was a member of one of the most prominent families in Fountain City. At one time during the Era of the dummy line, 1895 to 1905. And, and tell folks what the dummy, dummy line was. That was an unusual uh, feature, wasn't it? It was an unusual feature. It started behind uh, Old Gray Cemetery, ran out behind the uh, General Hospital, almost out Central Avenue. But And, and it was a steam-driven streetcar, wasn't it? But it ran five and a quarter miles to Fountain City yeah. by a rather circuitous route. And it serviced all the hosiery mills over around uh, Atlantic Avenue, Oklahoma Avenue. Mm -hmm. It serviced coster shops and downtown. In fact, uh, it carried 10,000 fares a day, which means wow. it was something of a success. And it was steam driven, somewhat underpowered but another one of the 20 stops between, uh, not downtown, but Emory Park, it started at Emory Park to Fountain City, was Connor Station. Later there was a Connor Road, which is where uh, Minus Funeral Home is. It's where my mother's um, great uncle, W.A.A. A. Connor, lived, who married John Adair's granddaughter which instantly gave him considerable property. In fact, he owned all the property between Mines Funeral Home and uh, Smithwood School. Mm -hmm. So the street was named Connor, and they wanted to honor the Connor family again, so they named Renwick Road, <laughs> which is Connor backwards. backwards. So, That's right. <laughs> so we were rather prominent for a while. One of uh, my fun things to do on Saturday was to take the streetcar to downtown Knoxville and visit the old Lost McGee Library mm -hmm. up on uh, the hill. Yeah. Cemetery Hill? Yeah, uh, Gallows Hill. <laughs> Gallows Hill, yeah. That's the old, the old name for your Civil War day. Was it telling uh, family stories that got you into telling Fountain City history? Mother was instrumental in uh, telling me family stories about the Connor family. That kind of got me started writing. And then Sandra Clark said one day I'd submitted it few articles on the, the dummy line to both her and Harry Moskus. Sandra Clark saw it and she said, why don't you write a monthly article for the Sharper News? And I did that for 10 years, so it was sort of the germination of the first book I did. And Mother's largely responsible for that. What particular stories in your book about Fountain City and who made a difference? Uh, uh, or do you think are especially memorable or you think people should know about? There are two people that I was, maybe three, that I was extremely interested in by just a little bit of knowledge. One was Colonel J.C. Woodward, who really did bring Fountain City into the modern era. He bought the park property, the what turned out to be the lake property, and he built the uh, Parkview Mansion by Bowman and Bowman Architects. They built that mansion in Westview the very same year, 1890, and bought the Fountainhead Hotel and established Fountain City Lake and 
markedly enhanced uh, Fountain City Park. And the other one uh, always fascinated was fascinated me with George Dempster. Seemed to be a self-made man and, and was. And in his teen years was operating a shovel on the Panama Canal. Yeah. Do you think he got his idea for his most famous invention at uh, working on the Panama Canal? He's built an attachment for his shovel. Cuts the time to dig whatever he's digging, maybe in half. And I think that did start it. And of course, later on, he's uh, he's his his name is uh, slightly corrupted, is famous around the world because he invented the dumpster in 1936, right. I believe. In many cases, Fountain City history is Knoxville history. Uh, uh, Harvey right. Broom, a mate, one of our, our major uh, conservationists, uh, lived here, founder of the Wilderness Society, a, a national organization, in the in the 1930s. Uh, Roy Acuff and and country music. No, nobody's more influential than. Then Roy Acuff, who uh, who lived here, was a Central High grad and was uh, learned to play fiddle just down the down the road here. The other person I just couldn't leave out of the book, Ellen McClung Berry, extremely uh, active in the Tennessee Antiquarian Society, and uh, gave from her family estate the uh, funds that built the McClung Tower at UT and. Mm -hmm a whole lot of other things were financed by her riches. She fell in love with Italian architecture and drew up some plans. So I've submitted, I hope it can be included, a uh, photograph of Bel Caro. Mm -hmm. They hired an architect from uh, Texas that really did the complete plans. That was her, her mansion mm -hmm. up on uh, Black Oak Ridge. Top of Black Oak Ridge. She had a very dramatic life and in good ways and horrifying ways uh, as well. She has a long story to tell. Another uh, uh, woman uh, who I've, I've gotten really fascinated with is Lucy Templeton, who uh, was a longtime Fountain City and, and one of the best writers of, uh, of newspaper columns. And the ultimate feminist before her time. <laughs> yeah. She so. invaded the second floor of the Knoxville Journal building, the only female on the floor. And it was atrocious, both the language and the smoke and the tobacco and so forth. So it took a little while to ingratiate them. One of the reporters just fainted dead away at his desk one day. They all panicked, of course, not knowing what to do. She ran down the street to her daddy's jewelry store, got a half pint of liquor and gave him a good shot of it. And he came to just like that. So. After that, she was a member of the club. Uh, I'm grateful to have your books in the, in the shelves. I'm also grateful that you're on the other end of the email when every time I have a question about something that I don't know the answer to and I know that you do know the answer to. You've been helpful to me on, on many of my projects over the years, and I thank you for it, uh, Dr. Tumblin. And I, I appreciate your work, and, and uh, you're uh, certainly a deserving honoree uh, of, our, of our award this year, and, and we have a, a plaque for you. <laughs> my favorite lake. I never swam in it. They tell me people did. <laughs> That's simply beautiful. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Tumblin, and uh, and congratulations again. Uh, I know we're running a bit late, but we just have one more item, and that's, uh, uh, I have the uh, honor of uh, introducing uh, our current board uh, president, uh, Casey Fox. She's a career librarian. Her current title is uh, Assistant Director of Advancement at UT Libraries. She's been at the Knox County Library before that. But I got to be aware of her passion for history uh, when she was the very able uh, project director for one of the most fascinating events we've had in in, uh, in in this century, I think, in terms of local history, and that was the Knoxville Stomp, the Festival of Lost Music, which we were involved with too, too but not as much as as Casey was. But uh, but uh, welcome, uh, Casey, and uh, and thanks for thanks for joining us today. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jack, and thank you, Dr. Tumblin, for your decades of dedication to illuminating and preserving the history of Fountain City. The value of your work is impossible to put a price on. We're so grateful to you. And thanks to each and every one of you who's here today, from our steadfast supporters who've been with KHP since the beginning, to those of you who are just learning about what we do. 
And I know we're living in an extraordinary time and, and that all of us are experiencing it in very different ways, but our different experiences become shared ones when we share our stories. And, and that's been the same throughout history. That's what makes the work of the Knoxville History Project so vital. Jack's writing, as he mentioned on the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, for example, is, is a balm for those of us who take comfort knowing that we're not the first Knoxvillians to go through something like this. And the more we understand the fraught history of institutionalized racism and the efficacy of past protest movements, the more we can understand how to turn the dial a little more towards justice in our own era. By hearing and sharing stories of the past, we can understand, empathize with, and connect to them in the present day. And I truly believe those historical connections make us better humans. But we can't connect to our fellow community members, past or present, if their stories aren't preserved. Like just about every other nonprofit, the COVID-19 crisis has made many things uncertain for KHP. But one thing we're certain of is that you believe in our work and you want to support it. And that support comes in so many forms, forwarding our e-newsletter e to a friend, telling your coworker about the gorgeous art wrap you saw on the way to work, or giving a copy of Historic Knoxville to your dad for Father's Day, which is Sunday, by the way, for those of you who have forgotten. And for the next 48 hours, you can get 15% uh, off all KHP merchandise uh, on our website. So just, just FYI. And so we are so grateful for all of the different ways you support us. But today we are here to ask you for a very specific kind of support, a direct financial gift. Now, I know I just said it's impossible to put a price on work like that of Dr. Tumblin, but that doesn't mean there isn't a cost involved. The work of preserving the history of a place and its people takes resources, tools, and time. And the staff of the Knoxville History Project, Paul, Nicole, and of course, Jack, need more of all three. Their work is not being done anywhere else, and it will only happen in a coordinated way through community support. As Paul said earlier, our fundraising goal today is $15,000. Now, I know it's an ambitious one, but if everybody here, I know we can accomplish it together, and if everybody here makes a gift of $100 today, we'll be golden. If that's not within your means right now, please know we're truly grateful for any amount that's reasonable for you. And we do have incentives. Each person who donates $50 or above uh, will receive a gorgeous set of historic Knoxville postcards delivered to you via the U.S. Postal Service. I don't know about you, but over the past few months, I've rediscovered the joy of sending actual mail to people, and I look forward to being able to do it so stylishly. And if you donate $100 or more, we'll also mail you our next freshly researched story collection booklet in the fall. As board chair, I'm asking you to make an investment in preserving our shared history. If you'd like to write a check, simply send it to 516 West Vine Avenue, Suite 8, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37902. You can also give online at our website, knoxvillehistoryproject.org. And let me tell you, it couldn't be easier. Um, we actually have a walkthrough on how to donate online. Alex, would you mind uh, advancing our slides through that? All right, so this is the front page of our website. If you go to knoxvillehistoryproject.org, this is what you'll see. And if you'll notice at the top, there's a navigation bar and there's a button that says donate. And I believe that's circled on the next slide. Correct, there you go. And so if you hit that button, it'll take you to a screen on the next slide. Um, and then you see that those big letters that say click here to donate, click on through to that and that will take you to the donation page. Beautiful. And you can um, pick your donation amount there and um, process your payment online. It's very quick and easy. Um, I also uh, would like to encourage you to consider a monthly recurring gift to the Knoxville History Project. Um, again, just think for the cost of one Starbucks a month, if you give up your one Starbucks a month, you can um, preserve the stories and experiences of this fantastic city all year round. If you're interested in setting up a recurring gift, you can contact um, Paul at KnoxvilleHistoryProject.org and he'll help you set that up. Um, once again, thank you all so much for coming. I know many of us are burned out on virtual meetings, so it means so much that you uh, chose to share your time with everybody at KHP today. Um, thank you to Dr. Tumlin. Thank you um, for those of you who produced the um, the Tennessee Valley Fair video. I look forward to seeing the whole thing. And um, we're just so grateful for your presence and your support. And I'll throw it back to Paul now for some final words. 
Well, thank you, Casey, and thank you, Jack, uh, and thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, we can, uh, if anyone has any questions, or if we can uh, answer any questions in the Q&A. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can wrap up the presentation, and you can spend a few more minutes in the, in the virtual tables. But again, thank you so much for being part of this uh, wonderful experience. Um, not talking about the virtual thing, I'm just talking about the Knoxville History Project to re make sto new stories available for everyone in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of media, whether in publications and talks and tours, podcasts, documentaries, all that media is, is that we're looking forward to telling Knoxville stories in all those medias over, over the years. So if any, if, unless anyone has any questions, we'll uh, wrap up the presentation. Uh, again, thank you for supporting us. We look, cannot, cannot wait to see you back in person and uh, enjoy some more time in the, in the social uh, virtual tables. Thanks again. Thank you.